seconds your name and something that Colin Kill Columba means to you. like an unclaimed black hogget while you sleep in a nettle bed. He will wander through memories of wild loving in dog violet and red clover meadows. He will rest in the ledges of your heart just as puffins and kittywalks nest in sea stacks. He will cling to the creases of your feet when you trudge on damp sand, salt water drenching your skin. He will keep an oil lamp burning in the abandoned lighthouse and watch you sail away. St. Colin Kill has always fascinated me, not only because he was a great Christian saint, but he was also a seaman. He went seafaring in a small open boat like I did as a youngster growing up in Cork. And at the great, at the lovely sessions organized by the Songhouse in County Donegal, I thought about what it must have been like 1500 years ago after he had left Ireland. So I wrote Night Shore. Night Shore. Dark when we landed, raised our corach from the restless sea, heavy like our hearts. The abbot went up the hill to see the sun rise, he said, in the northeast. But we knew his eyes would be like spears pointed southwest for a sign. Always looking back, we said, saddens the heart. Ah, relief and calm on him after coming down. Round the back of the island, he said, we'll settle there. And so it was, exchanging oars for stones, raising walls, not currucks. Bells and voices heal the wound of a night departure, a night arrival on this stony shore. Our memories like flotsam wash up and down with the shingle, each wave a tear for those whom we will never see again. Growing up by the stony shore in the far south, boats hauled above high tide, like another poet's sea longing, I long for familiar coastal places where ebb and flow dictate the times of our comings and goings, a time to launch, a time to retreat, or are we no more than stones on the beach forever pulled by the sea, moving in waves of storm or calm? The poem that I wrote is called The Psalm of Lugna. And as I was attending the poetry workshops, I wanted to learn more about St. Cullum Cale. And I particularly wanted to hear stories of Colum Kill, um, just as I'm inspired by the stories of St. Patrick and the stories of St. Bridget. And Charlie told us a story of a woman who was the wife of the ugly man. And she went to talk with Colum Kill because she did not want to sleep with her husband. And they talked through the nature of marriage. And I really felt for this man, this husband, Lugna, described as the ugly man who was rejected by his wife. And the wife spent the night in prayer and reflection with Colum Kill. And in the morning, where there had been hatred, now there was love. And I was really struck by that, by that change that came about. And so the poem that I've written, The Psalm of Lugna, is from the perspective of the husband. What do I do? I am cast out by she that I love. She gives to me tea and stew, but
but not the sweet kisses of her lips. My shirts she wash and spin, but not caress and hold my hand and hold my body close. She calls to me to build a wall and haul and cut the sod, but she does not call for me. Let the walls of our house be the strength of my body, the fire that burns, the spark of our love, the stars in the sky, the song of our love, and every stitch and button clasped embroidered with her love and delight in me. Let her sing of my strength, of my goodness, sing of the light in my brow. Look at me with pride and possession and say, he is mine, his skin is sweet to me, life to me. Let her adore me and proclaim to heaven, this is my man. Inspired by the third workshop and this was partly inspired then by the Lugna uh, story and also when Charlie read out a poem by I think it was Elizabeth Rimmer there were three words in particular I think this was to do with the Selkie uh, there were three words in particular that stood out to me uh, salt scales and traces uh, and I took those three words as the to, to be the, the starting line I suppose of this poem and this poem's uh, the first draft was untitled and it's a little bit long and then I'll read the second draft then. This was untitled. Traces of salt and scales glisten on my white skin. I run my fingers on my lips. They are full, a natural pout. I close my eyes, tapping my lips repeatedly, salt diminishing each time. I lie down. I won't wash tonight. I want the free twilight sea on me to remember, to remind me who I am. I will still be me. I won't sleep. The hours stretch ahead like wave crests to the horizon. I imagine the salt mixed with the water. It is deep and I hear their unhidden voices. It's simple, really. Love has filled my heart where hate once lived. That will suffice. I think of the brute. He will be gone with the sea tomorrow. And one day a child will set me free. So the next version of this is called Maria in the Dead Sea. Salt, scales and traces glisten on dark skin. Eyes closed, absently touching full lips with salted fingers, Maria remembers floating like jetsam in the Dead Sea. Sleep won't wash over tonight. Time drifts like wave crests. Oars will assert to the shore. Imagine unhidden voices. The decision will be diminishment. Uh, that's it. Thanks for uh, listening. <laughs> Uh, this next poem is called Pogue, and it's from, uh, it's the same story as, as the one that Maria talked about, about um, Lukna and, uh, and him, him and his wife going to see Conkill. This is from the uh, viewpoint of one of uh, Lukna's wife's friends about what happens when she comes back the next day. Pogue. What's up with her today? She's glowing, like she's had a decent ride, the kind that comes but rarely when they find a softness, a kindness, that doesn't need a drink or a beating or memory of the betrothal. And look at him, he's almost handsome, 
and not slapping the kids, though their noise would try a saint. And as for the bloody saint, he's looking even more pleased with himself than usual. But, oh God, I would. Would you? Of course, but could you bear the preening? Still, he can't and won't, and he hates us for that fact. So Christ knows why she went to him for advice. Has she betrayed us? That luck now was never getting any was a given. Something we knew deeply, like how tenderness only lives amongst the young, and Rona's pies are always the sweetest, and women just know it better than them. And today, mine gave me a kiss without the dance. Torpog de diyi orum, he'd said, and I acted like I hadn't heard. And he took one without asking. And I can't say I minded so much. And the final poem is called The Fox and the Fast. That fox telling me to fast. I was hungry, ravenous. I knew at once that I would not obey. And the very next thing I did was go to the kitchen, take some bread, go to the old apple tree, pick three windfall apples from October's sodden grass. That evening, door closed by the fading firelight, I frowned at the full moon and pushed the kittens unwelcome from my impatient lap. I was in no mood for beauty, no mood for soft affection. I ripped the bread and like a starving fox, I ate, cheeks bulging, crumbs spilling, sick to the stomach I am. See how my very being is being constrained. One after another, I ate the red skinned apples, bruises, betrayal, making them all the sweeter. That fox telling me to fast. My chin dripped with juices and I wiped it with my sleeve, just like my mother told me not to, just like my brothers always did. That fox, that fox. Sleep didn't come that night and my belly ached with apples. I lay, an angry animal gone to ground concealing itself from raptor's claw, silence, waiting. My thoughts rattled, shook the night, boxes everywhere. Until in the granite pink light of dawn, the one kitten came to me, the little one, my dear one, the one with the crumpled ear, the too little hind leg. I stroked her little head, her ear, her leg, and loved her entirely. Cold daylight came, the foxes fled, and finally rest. Thank you. And then thinking further about the Abbey and what might have been going on there in those far off times, I thought, you know, whatever there is about St. Cullum Key, he was also a druid. He could do all kinds of very interesting things like foretelling the future. And the Abbey could have been in those days a strange place. And here I am, one of the monks, and this is simply called Night Shore Continued. The abbot has me walking the shore. Continue searching, he said, until you find. And into my leather satchel I place some bones to be taken to the special store where Brother Anthony will carbon date them using the machine the abbot bought from London three years after we landed. Now I find a foot sandal, not leather, made in China, must have come a long way on some ocean current or brought by Corrach. Last night he lectured us on the multivariate universe, black holes and the Schwarzschild radius and the great flaring forth, past, present and future, held in the fist of his saffron robe, while behind him on the wall pictures of Gautama, Buddha, and the Dalai Lama. Yesterday I found two small soft cushions, joined by a metal thong, which he placed over his head and went into a meditation that pleased him greatly. My reward was an extra portion of care-dried dung from our dairy herd to burn for warmth in my small cell stove. Nights are going cold, days drawing in. One moon ago at dusk, Law Lunasa, we found her, when the brothers had climbed Dooney and the abbot calling on Lou, from Doom coming out of the stars over distant Marshlacht. This was the year that Sweden, son of Muel Omil, 
scribe of Cluan Machlisha, was taken by God. The annals of Ulster would describe her. Sixty-five yards her length, the finger of her hand two yards, her nose the same, six yards her hair, her skin swan white. The rise and fall of her breasts gave no sign of from where she had come. The abbot and brothers spread out their arms, floating down like gulls from hilltop to shore. His face bright gold, his arm pure silver, the brother's blue skin. On her rib cage he laid the altar cloth, blessed her with holy oil and sacred water from Tubber Maguia Ohuid, while she whispered the abbot's name to give him courage for oars and sea. From her eye flowed a tear which he saved in a small cup, that our crops might be free of blight and our trees alive with fruit. Scented by her last long breath, how we buried the body, I cannot tell, but many oaks grow on the island tall and thick, and from the sawn beams in the abbey roof a small tear would sometimes drop as we chanted matins or lauds. Never again would I visit the shore, for the brothers would tell me of strange things washed up by the sea, fine bone china, parts of metal boats scorched by fire. And the abbey, the abbot, continued his lectures, touching evolution, the self-organizing universe, the anthropic principle and dark matter. Some of our brothers dozed as he spoke, while the unseen stars wheeled above the abbey roof to the turning of the earth. Eche Deus. Thank you.